So if you've seen me on here, awesome. Um, if, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please let me know. But it's Valentine's Day, so I'd really like everybody who watches this to love me. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about uh, dry cutting because something that I've noticed, um, I did a, I've done a razored bob, I did a shaggy long bob, and um, today I wanted to go in a different direction because I've noticed everyone seems to be only talking about shags and mullets. Which means that the more people talk about it, the more I feel like it's not far from being on its way out because the more trendy things become, the less uh, hip it is to subscribe to them. So trends, uh, I think, are always going to rotate around, and I think long, pretty hair is always going to be, you know, on point. And um, something I've noticed a lot in the salon is my clients wanted to be really protective over their length that they grew out during COVID. Now, when someone is protective over their length, and the first thing you do is start by cutting the hair for 20 minutes in the back of their hair where all their length is targeted, they're gonna be a little bit, you know, uh, unsettled. So what Kristen, uh, Kristen is a very dear old friend of mine, so what we've done is uh, we've just ironed her hair out smooth, and I'm looking at the shape and assessing it, and I'm just seeing what's going on with it because I really wanna use dry techniques that are really applicable to salon work. Uh, to keep as much length while like, giving it as much interest and movement as we possibly can. So we want to keep her length as, as much as possible, but you know, she does have some ends need cleaning up from having fine hair that's been highlighted a, a lot. Uh, she also has a little bit of a kind of natural concave shape in the front, which tends to be a pretty easy thing to achieve when you have hair that's layered, plus you look at the pattern of the hairline and how it drops towards the temporal corner and then it comes down. So I'm gonna start off by cutting her interior layers first because layers are going to remove weight, right? One length hair cutting builds the most amount of weight. Graduation, which is anything from 89 degrees to zero degrees or to one degree, is gonna build up a shape. And anything from 90 above off the round of the head is going to remove weight. So we're gonna remove weight. And I'm gonna do so by creating uh, a concave layer using a slide cutting technique, but on a bias. So uh, in our education program, we used to have a haircut shape that was called the sway, which was a variation of uh, an old Sassoon technique, but the sway was essentially uh, a combination of graduation, layering, and bias cutting that was uh, all you know, put into one shape to teach students how to cut the posh bias short haircut. So, and a bias is when anything is cut into infinity, right without end. So, I'm not gonna worry about my length until the end because what I wanna do is remove the most amount of weight possible and then create a strong outline from that shattered outline. So I'm gonna start from the crown and I'm gonna take a center section Okay, and I'm gonna comb it out using my wide teeth first because you don't wanna go through for broke right with, with your fine teeth and rip through all these tangles. So I'm gonna use my fine teeth to detangle the hair and then I'm gonna flip my comb around, right? And it's not just a trick, it's really actually helpful for, for salon work, right? So wide teeth, flip through with my fine teeth so I actually have a fair amount of tension and I'm gonna hold the hair up where my length is starting to drop out, okay? Now, here's the bias part. So here's my concave shape. My left arm that's holding the hair is elevated up and is pointing the internal shape downward towards the ground. And my cutting arm is diagonal working up. So this is a really organic concave flow, okay? So now I'm gonna take my cutting scissors, my shears, and I'm going to only cut with the inside of my blade right here, and I'm gonna work out into the length of my shape, sliding as I go towards the outline, okay? So I'm gonna do that one more time. So somebody was just asking about, could you show us what it looks like before? Basically with, uh, with her hair is very long. If I get in here, you can see there's barely any layering in her hair whatsoever. And so what Sean's doing is actually adding some shape to this just extremely long, just lightly layered hair and actually gonna create a lot of movement through what he's doing. 
Basically, if you look at hair that's this long, especially when it's on the finer side, she has quite a bit of hair, but each strand is fairly fine and it's been uh, chemically treated with some, uh, obviously with some highlights. What you're doing is, what, or what Sean's doing is he's trying to add the movement and actually let those layers show, as well as what let the highlight show. A lot of times, if you were to just try to put in, say, two or three inches worth of layers into some long hair like this that's been highlighted, you're gonna end up with polka dots or leopard, leopard spots. Totally. That just do not become flattering. But by the way that Sean's cutting, so he'd mentioned something called bias. Um, I know Sean knows a bit about this because his mother was really into clothing as well, but the actual <laughs> cutting of clothing called bias cutting is actually made to cut against the grain of the fabric. So when Sean has taken this vertical section, you would think he would just be lifting up and cutting horizontally, but instead he's cutting concave, and because he's cutting up and out with this slicing technique, that is actually cutting against the head shape. That's creating an internal concave that's going to add a bit of volume through the crown, but then it's gonna hug through the occipital bone and let the hair kind of move at the bottom. Absolutely, I mean, that's about as well explained as it possibly could be. The whole point of a concave when, we're, when um, uh, designers and seamstresses were working with it was that it wasn't, it was supposed to be a really kind of just uh, a, a, a line that flowed and flared into infinity, right? And my mom would talk about bias cutting. So when I was growing up, my mom was a seamstress that did all the ballet work for like the Brunel University ballet program, every other uh, ballet program in Metro Atlanta. I mean, uh, my daughter dances at the studio that I used to sit in the car waiting for my mom to get out from fitting this floor. So, you know, it's, it, it all is applicable to the same when you're using scissors and you're cutting with any kind of fabric and hair is a fabric, it all applies, right? So now you'll see that I'm working towards the sides. This is where your concave shape is really important to maintain, okay? So I'll spin the chair so we can see. So again, everything is still working up and the fine teeth are important. And you can also see that my roots are all combed cleanly off the head. It doesn't matter that I'm working with dry hair. Everything is coming perpendicular to the floor so that I have even direction for everything to work in, right? So now here's my guide and you can see just like all cutting, whether it's wet or it's dry, I have a guide. And I'm starting from that guide and I'm working up and out, sliding throughout the length of my shape, okay? I've actually got a friend of mine, uh, his name's Charlie Gray over in London. He's a, he's mostly does men's education, but he does do some women's as well. But he, I, I was actually watching him do a demonstration about two years ago, and he said something that was one of those uh -huh. uh, well, yeah, it was one of those things that you've been doing your whole life, but you don't realize it. And one thing that I noticed like with Sean is see how he grabbed the hair at the root when he just combed through? Just like what he was saying, the root's uh, saying straight, it's saying taunt, it's not going to have little buckles in it. What Charlie had mentioned was like whenever he combs out of the head, he makes sure that he puts his hands close to the head to grab the hair. That way it doesn't end up buckling. A lot of times you'll see people that'll just grab halfway up the shaft. And then when you go to cross check their work, you find all of these bumps, ridges, hills and valleys. And you don't necessarily know what they've come from. And really what it's come from is the fact that they didn't comb the hair properly. Absolutely. That's, I mean, you know, the foundations and the basic techniques of hair cutting are so important for you to learn and master, regardless of when you went to hair school or what trends are prevalent in popular culture. Uh, I mean, it's so important. That's why it's honestly a blessing and a curse that right now our haircutting education culture is so oversaturated with uh, social media based uh, kind of guerrilla education because sometimes these people do really interesting things that are executed in a way that, you know, it's not that I'm the best, the best hairdresser in the world, I'm not, but I'm definitely well-trained and I train people to also be well-trained. So when you watch someone who just twists the entire head into the front and just takes texturizing scissors and just goes like this to do something that looks cool on Instagram, 
it's just like, oh man. But you know, again, I think that we have to remember that all the basics apply no matter how long you've been cutting hair or what type of hair cutting you're doing, right? So again, working my way through, now I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna continue my way through because my center guide is my basis for the entire haircut. So if you were a novice and you were trying to establish symmetry, what you might wanna do is do the entire back from um, the line of indentation back, right? But I'm going to just work my way through. The only difference is that because I'm going to do a different type of graduation in the front, I'm gonna start over directing this hair back. Now you can see how right now we have a flat plane that is not going to lay into the shoulders nicely, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna collapse that weight so that Kristen still has a nice amount of short internal movement while having it lay really nicely into the shoulders because uh, there's nothing to me that you have to work harder to make something out of than a long flat line. Right, that's why it's so interesting that so many uh, girls that curl their hair want one length haircuts now because by default, one length hair below a certain length doesn't do anything, which is why they have to work so hard with a curling iron and dry shampoo to make something interesting happen. Whereas you could just really politely and uh, professionally <laughs> talk them into some different movements so that they can have options with their hair. Right? That's why I think it's important as a hairdresser to always try to uh, dominate the conversation with your clients and steer them in the right direction because I let my clients show me pictures of what inspires them all day long, but I still talk to them about what I think those pictures need to be and how we can translate that to be something good for their hair and their face shape. Yeah, somebody just asked a question and go, was um, why not put some wax in the hair to make it easier to control? Uh, that is a possibility in some cases. Uh, with Kristen's hair here, I think that would actually make those it's ends baby. stick. It's baby fine, baby yeah, fine Yeah, it would hair. probably stick way too much to, for him to use the fine teeth of the comb. Uh, instead, when he was prepping the hair, he uh, smoothed her hair out and took just a touch of a very, very light uh, aerosol hairspray and I believe that's giving him enough control without, uh, without making it stick. Even with that little bit in the hair, that actually still will make this baby fine um, highlighted hair stick together. No, if you're not I'll, I'll show you guys that real quick. So, um, really subtle, subtle Aveda plug, right? So I love air control because to me, air control was dry shampoo before dry shampoo was a marketable product. It's a granule based hairspray, so I always tell my clients, if you're not looking for hold, but you want something to grit your hair up when it's too clean, hold your hand out, you can feel it. It's very dry, it just gives a little bit of a granule kind of texture. So what I did with Kristen's hair was just a little bit of dry spraying through the internal shape, right? And then I'll actually comb through it with my Y teeth so I can distribute the granules. And then it's a lot easier for me to work with because I still plan on taking her very uh, straight, smooth hair, which I don't think she really loves having that much, and putting some waves into it to just show what it looks like with the layers that we cut into the hair when I'm done. And the more wax you put in to assess the shape when you're cutting it, the more limited you are from how you can finish it when it's dry, okay? And we are getting people logging in from all over the world, uh, people from the Middle East, from Europe, all over the place that I've been seeing. Uh, thank you all for logging in. We love, that's the greatest thing about this hair braiding community is the fact that we can share our techniques on all sides of the globe uh, just instantaneously and it's not, we don't have to get into a plane, we don't have to go to a, uh, to a seminar to share some education. Uh, we've gotten a couple of people thanking you for the tips. Um, a one person asking, where are you located? We're actually here in Atlanta, Georgia. We're at Van Michael Salons here in Atlanta, Georgia. We're right now at our East Cobb location. Our East Cobb location is one of two locations that are closed on Mondays. So those are the two locations that we typically do our education out of um, on Mondays. So that's wh where we are here as well as people are coming in from Texas and Toronto, multiple people from Toronto. Uh, we've got oh, a little bit, oh. Yeah, we've gotten a, a bit of a cold streak here for us, but I, it is nowhere near the amount of uh, cold that you're getting there. Some people over in Scotland, 
I just want to say hello to all of you and thank you very much for logging in. Once again, I'm Daniel Holzberger with Van Michael Salons. This is my good friend, Sean, and he's been an educator with us. Gosh, now I've known Sean since he seemed like he was a little kid and now he's a grown man. And, uh, you know, now he's got <laughs> little kids. So it's amazing to have seen him grow up and become such an amazing hairdresser. Uh, what he's been doing so far, if for those of you who've just logged in, as he's been doing pivoting sections with concave layers, but what he's been doing is he's been cutting a bit of an arcing biased section throughout so that he can actually create a little bit of volume on this extremely dense yet fine hair. It's extremely long. He has not even touched the length whatsoever. Just took it from almost completely one length to creating a nice internal layer. And he's been working, he worked the left side first, worked pivoting sections until he hit basically right at the top of the ear and then over directed everything back so that it would maintain some length through the front because I know that he's gonna come back through and recut that front. So as you can see, right, like I'm gonna double check my internal guide because if I create a concave guideline in the center, okay, and I pivot each subsequent section that is stemming out from my point of origin, I should have symmetry and balance from side to side, okay? So now what's really easy to do when you are rounding through the head shape is to end up uh, either on your weak or dominant side, gaining too much length or losing too much length. And I talk about this a lot with my students, and the easiest thing to do with that is to change your body position, right? So thankfully, I have symmetry. Now, the nice thing about this haircut is that it doesn't have to be exact, right? Uh, I want symmetry, but I don't want absolute perfection because the whole point of only cutting with the interior uh, of my shears is that I want to create a razor type technique, right? And not ever closing my shears all the way. I'm always pushing the hair. So think about this, right? When you're working with your shears, the tip of your blade is the strongest part to cut with, okay? You're always gonna get the cleanest line if you cut this way. Now, if you only cut with the internal area of your shear, you're basically pushing the hair, which is why when you're teaching people to cut a one length outline, teaching them where they start cutting like this is really bad because they're gonna have to constantly go through and recut because every time they cut, they're pushing the hair a little bit more every time, right? So this, I'm literally pushing the hair to create a softer razor type line. So real quickly, put those scissors up again, let me, and open up. So. So, hold on, I just wanna show one thing. This is open. blunt, right? So this is the tip of the shear is where I would be cutting a precise line with zero push whatsoever. Whereas this, what I'm actually oh, doing. Those up again for me, yeah. show one thing also. So what I'm actually doing with my shear is I'm not opening or closing all the way. I'm literally using the interior of my shear to actually push the hair. And I'm just basically creating a little bit of a razor type technique that every time there is the smallest amount of hair that comes off like a razor. Hold on, close your shears. Let me show you something. So also, if you look at this with the shear, see how this is thicker than this? What happens is you're, con you're much more convex here than you are here. Your blade is closer to 43 degrees of angle at, from the tip forward. So that's gonna be the closest thing to a razor blade to create an actual clean cut. So what ends up happening is when you do open and close that closer to the bolt, you'll actually have a tendency to push because it's a little more convex. Yeah. That's why the large um, dry cutting scissors are actually more rounded than they are actually a straight line because they're designed for slice cutting. So whenever you are doing, whether you're doing it wet or dry, if you're doing any kind of a bias or a slice, you're gonna wanna tend to stay on a little bit more of the fatter part of the shear. Now, a couple of other questions I'm just gonna catch back up with, was somebody asked, you know, what was the dry product you used? He used a product by Aveda called Air Control. It's a very light hairspray, very low alcohol base, so what ends up happening is it almost works, uh, not quite exactly like dry shampoo, but it does give that little bit of grit that dry shampoo does, but it doesn't have real hard hold because of the lack of um, 
alcohol. I don't use it to hold clients hair. Usually what I do is I use it to dirty up very clean hair that's not behaving as well as it could be on the second day. That's yeah. what I use it for. Very easy way. A couple of people are asking, yes, he was using pie sectioning. Basically he started off uh, to gain his length or to gain his outline. He took his length from the center back took a pivoting sections, elevated those straight up, and then cut with a slicing concave. He got his guide by basically looking, once the outline fell out, he then looked and said, what kind of, where do I need to start my point to create the proper angle that he wanted? So he was able to start his guide by looking at where the outline was gonna be and then just shifting his fingers down, almost like so, how you're watching him do this as well. He's just eyeing from short to long at that point. Right, exactly. So, and I mean, again, remember with long hair, the whole point of layering the hair is to create movement while having respect for where the outline sits, okay? Which I'll show you exactly what Dan was just explaining real quick. I chose my outline by allowing the length to dictate what my outline length should, or where my internal layer should be, right? So if I'm going to have my length sit this long, I can't quite take layers this short, can I? Because natural law of physics would say that when I cut my line out to the, the exterior of my shape, right, I'm actually going to be cutting three inches off of my outline. Whereas if I were to pull to where my outline just begins to drop out, then wherever my outline drops out is the shortest point of my concave layering shape. Now, if you want shorter layers, that's when you can get into either disconnection or a different layering technique, right? So something that we explain a lot within our, uh, within our education program is the importance of using images rather than just describing what the client wants and what you're going to do because our lingo is different than their lingo, right? They'll use words like choppy, right? My favorite is when they say like, I really want a layer that sits here and then a layer that sits here, right? That doesn't mean anything. Or when they say, I really want choppy layers, you're like, well, you've got really fine hair. So then you show them images and if they t show you images that are really short, but they have really long hair, that's where concave layers might work. If they show you hair that is a lot longer with the layers, but maybe it's more texture on the bottom, that's where instead of you having a concave layer, maybe you're gonna shift your angle to where more convex, where it's a flat plane that's relative to the round of the head, where you actually take more weight out of the bottom outline while leaving the internal layers a little bit longer, and then maybe you can break that up with a little bit of dry point cutting at the end, okay? So you have to let your portfolio dictate what you're going to do and you have to be a professional hairdresser and actually describe and discuss it with your client so that you don't let a person who doesn't do hair completely control the nature of your conversation. Uh, and I would say the longer you do hair, the better you get at uh, owning that side of your chair, but you do have to take control of the chair uh, because clients I think are a little bit too educated nowadays. So sometimes they tend to be a little bit more dominant with what they want and uh, might not be the best thing for their hair. But I don't know how you feel about this, Daniel, but like um, at this point in my career, I know that if someone comes to me for something that's really in bad taste and they come to me multiple times asking for something that's in bad taste, I'll just eventually explain to them, I'll do this and I'll make it look the best it possibly can look, but just know that it might not look the same as the picture on you. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things that goes back to educating your clients. Yep. You know, luckily for me, I have been working for Van Michael for 22 years at this point. So I've got some clients, I have quite a few clients that have had for more than 20 years. So I can be extremely blunt with them. The ones that are still alive. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you know that's, how, that's how I check. You know, if I get no showed, I check the obituaries. <laughs> oh my God. So, Dolores. but no, the... Um, but the truth of the matter is once you have had clients for a long time, you can be a little more blunt with them, but I still get new clients. I had two new clients in the last uh, couple of days and you do need to be a little more um, guiding with them. Um, but at this point, I also am at the point where I want to make sure that I'm educating them, not just pushing them in the certain direction. Right. 
And uh, actually somebody's saying something about that right now. They're saying it's the, the best thing uh, to educate the customer on what may be the best advice for their hair and what would be the best for them. I'm always straight with them. And I've had my salon and spa for 38 years. Jeez, that, I, that is very commendable because I have- uh, Numbers don't lie. Yeah, I've been a salon owner for now for 12 years. And um, I have to say, it, it is not the easiest thing. A lot of times hairdressers don't realize how hard it is to actually be a salon owner. Uh, another person saying, yes, they uh, trust me when I speak. Um, even my new clients because educating them is so important. Yeah, I'll give you guys a real quick uh, thing, uh, story or tidbit. A good friend of mine, Antoinette Beender, she is the uh, global creative director for Aveda and has been with Aveda for many years. She was one of my mentors when I was younger and she's still a mentor in life at this point with me. But she said, some, uh, she said something on stage one time, we were doing a hair show in Cincinnati and she said that the three most important words that you could hear from a client are, I trust you. And the thing that is amazing about that is it's so true. As soon as they trust you, that's when the service is gonna be so much easier. Yeah. If they know where you're going with this, if they don't have any kind of apprehension about you doing their hair, they are going to enjoy this so much more rather than in a situation where someone could be like white knuckled underneath the cape and worried about every snip that you do. You really wanna gain their trust. And just like, um, I, I'm sorry, I gotta get the name, uh, Penna said just a minute ago, that educating them is very important because you want to gain their trust. And I can't tell you how many times, by the time I'm done with my consultation, that a brand new client will use those words, will say, do whatever you want, I trust you. And you really do have them once you have those three words. It's true. Uh, I, I always, it still, it still blows my mind when people say that because I'm like, well, cool, you know? I, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's cool that people trust us with, with their image. I mean, because when you think about it, right, your hair is the mantle that sits on top of the fireplace. It's the first thing that everyone looks at, so it is a big deal. Okay, so now we have a shape that's really naturally starting to happen. <clears throat> so uh, something that Kristen did tell me was that she didn't want a lot of really short layers in the front, right? She does have a natural concave shape going on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna really lightly slice through it to create a little bit of a pieciness with what's already happening and just give definition to the shape that's naturally there already, right? So I don't wanna like really aggressively pull through the hair. So what I'm doing is I'm just I'm using my index and my middle finger on my left hand to just grab the hair that's naturally there already and just give it a little bit more of a PC definition to it because it's already there. The hair already is, is laying this way. I'm just making it look like something definite, okay? And what I like about this, I know some people don't really like to do any kind of a frame in the hair, but the way I look at it, the hair is the most fine and brittle around the hairline, and if you don't do anything to it, it doesn't do anything. So this, I'm giving it a natural, a, like a, a more established uh, shape, okay? And I'm also doing so by, if you'll notice, I'm not closing my shears all the way, creating a really definite aggressive line. I'm still going through with a razor type technique and just slicing through to give it a wispy, airy flow to it, okay? I think that's a really important thing to know how to do. You know, a lot of times when people have fine hair, Obviously, the hair around the front hairline is drastically finer than the hair around the back hairline. And then on top of that, it's usually had the most amount of, you know, um, damage done to it or, uh, the, or just actually just, you know, environmental damage to it from the sun, from, uh, from blow drying, from everything that you do to the hair. Plus, any kind, generally speaking, most women want their hair to be lighter around the front. So it's very easy for people to almost either leave hair alone around the front because they're afraid if they cut anything, it's gonna be gone, or they go way too much and all of a sudden there's big gaps in the hair. But this little technique that you're doing is phenomenal to me. Like he's just holding the, the hair so gingerly, just using a little bit of tension, just so that he can slice through and then create this really nice soft line I mean, that looks so much denser. Looking right, at the so one like, look, side to the other, it's drastically different on how much healthier it looks on the right versus the left. But meanwhile, it's, it's 
still has that texture versus just a solid line that you created. Well, right, so it has texture, but also is still respecting what she discussed during said consultation where she doesn't want a lot of aggressively short layers. These are still the same type of outline shape that was already there. It just is more purposeful, okay? Absolutely. So then again, you have to change your technique from side to side, right? The same way that we would cut on this side, right? Versus cutting this way. On this side, we're able to go this way. On this way, or on the right side, what I have to do is I have to uh, flip my cutting hand around to I'm working in the opposite direction. Okay. Yeah, so you, and the other thing that I like to mention also is when you're doing any kind of slice cutting, whether it is the way that he was cutting the bias up at the top or whether he's slice cutting here on the, uh, around the face, he's cutting with the, the grain of the hair, with the grain of the hair. Absolutely. He's cutting with the cuticle so that it doesn't blow that apart. A lot of times people will go against the cuticle. I, uh, makes an amazing look, but what ends up happening, especially if it's chemically treated hair, is it tends to blow that cuticle up. Um, this is absolutely uh, something that is a must, in my opinion, if you're gonna do slice cutting. Always cut with the grain of the hair, cut with the cuticle. Well, it's like anything, right? Like, I mean, again, hair is a fabric. Anything, whether you're chopping through wood, whether you're slicing a piece of meat, you know, I mean, if you go against it really hard, you can hear it scraping because it's not, it's not a natural cut, right? Whereas this one, I'm just working through with the grain, because hair, if you look at hair under a really fine microscope, it almost looks like a twig. You can see it's grain, okay? And if you go against that grain, you're going to blow it out and you do it all over the head, it's going to be really blown out and really just not flattering, right? So now, again, I'm working from the internal out to the outline of my shape. The reason why I'm doing this is because um, I'm trying to just work out to the corner so where I don't end up working from my corner in and getting too short by the time I get to the inside of my shape, okay? This is the shortest point that I don't wanna take any shorter, so I'm working from there to the outline. And the right side of her hair is a little bit more aggressively, uh, let's say pre-concaved, probably just due to you know, being a little bit more chemically loved. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say also, uh, you, you're right-handed as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, sometimes that has a tendency to get a little more blow drying on that side as well, just because it's a little more aerodynamically correct. So now you can see Sean's going through just the same way. Looks like we are getting tons of people from all over watching. I do believe you have a new best friend in our friend uh, uh, Pena that uh, or Pena that is uh, been watching you cut hair. She's been doing hair uh, or owned a salon for 38 years, which is absolutely amazing. But she keeps giving you tons of compliments. Uh, this is really starting to come together. I mean, really, his internal shape at this point looks about perfect to me. Uh, I mean, really, it's one of those things that when you saw him start with this hair, it was almost completely one length, except for just a little bit of face framing. And we have made a couple of jokes that we think that that face framing may have been created by bleach more than actual scissors. And Although that, my friend Mallory did an amazing job coloring yeah. her hair. It's just the natural byproduct of what happens when you want money pieces, but you've just got a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a brittle hair texture, that's it. And this is, to me, this is just where you try to also work in tandem with your colorist, right? Like if someone has fine hair and you know that a certain color is the end objective, you're going to have to communicate about the way it ends up being cut and the way it ends up being colored at the end, okay? So now, all we're gonna do, now this is the important thing, right? Because now we're finished with our overall uh, mm. internal layering shape. So the hair is finest at the length that it possibly can be, right? So, important thing for me to discuss with people. When you're cutting long hair in the outline, okay, a lot of times I'll see my students working with these capes and they're all bunching up, right? And so I can see them spending half the time trying to hold the hair. So easy to do. Pull the cape so that it's taut at the shoulder. Take a clip, clip it, flat surface to work on. It seems so simple, right? So I'm gonna raise her up so that it's a little bit more comfortable on my back because I did back the other day and I'm pretty sore. And I'm gonna tilt her head down just the same that I would in any one length technique, right? All the same principles apply, okay? 
And using a freehand technique, I'm literally just going to connect point A to point B where the hair really starts to break up from the front outline. Going back to talking about those scissors, you can see he's cutting with probably the first third or maybe half of the blade because that's where the blade is gonna be the smallest. That's where the blade's gonna be the sharpest. It's not gonna push the hair, it's gonna cut the hair. That's right. And this doesn't come through on camera nearly like it does in real life. The, the quality of her hair has just jumped tenfold by taking that, whatever it was, an inch off the bottom. And just an inch, yeah. just an inch. <laughs> it needed it. <laughs> yeah, and then throughout the hair, it looks so nice and silky. Whereas when I first, uh, this was the first time that I met, um, when I met Chris and when she walked in, uh, I was like, wow. Her hair, she's got amazing hair, but boy, it needs a haircut on the ends. And now looking at it, it really is night and day different on, on how beautiful the hair is. Yeah, I mean, literally, sometimes that's all you need. I mean, if you look at the ground, it's not like there's a ton of hair. This is where I think hairdressers need to sometimes remember when they're cutting people's hair, that it doesn't have to look like uh, a butcher shop on the ground every time someone comes in for a haircut, right? They're paying for their time and they're, they're paying for your expertise. They're not paying to leave every single time feeling like they got the most dramatic haircut, which probably sounds a little bit ridiculous coming from me because I've been told that I tend to be a little bit scissor happy, but that also could be because my mentor, Rob, was Captain Scissor Happy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we, I mean, I definitely think that it's important to make someone feel like they got a good haircut. And um, even as much hair as sometimes as my mentor would cut off of people's hair, I never saw them leave with anything but the biggest smile on their face, feeling that their hair was amazing. And so all I've done is cut just what needs to be cut off of the hair and left everything else, right? And, and so, I'll tell you what, a shout out to Mallory. The color does look unbelievably that was a beautiful. beautiful. Color. Yeah, absolutely. And it is now that these ends are cut off, I mean it is so it's such a beautiful, almost kind of beige color. It, it doesn't read quite as beigey on the camera as it is in real life, but I have to tell you the hair it looks uh, the best way to explain it right now, the hair looks expensive. It doesn't look like it was just, you know, like she just ran into some beauty parlor and got some highlights. It looks like she has been, had her hair cut and color done uh, very well and very professional. See, I told you you didn't look cheap. I told <laughs> Mallory, I trust you and just do what you want to do. She said, I, she said, I trust you. Did you hear that in her brain? I see her next week. To a different person, yes, to Mallory. Yeah. It was Mallory's birthday this past, what was it? Uh, actually, no, no, Mallory's birthday is today. Oh, well, so everybody happy birthday, on Mary. Wish Mallory. Wish the girl that colored Kristen's hair happy birthday. And it's, your it's my eight year old's birthday today. Just I so you I saw that. Know That's brain. pretty amazing. The cute, hold on a second. We have to do this real quick on Hair Brain because this kid is the cutest kid you've ever seen in your entire life. You're not biased or anything. No. Oh, so adorable. So what's, adorable. Even, what's even more cute is her big sister that we took a picture with is wearing her mom's leather jacket and one of our old Metallica shirts, just owning it. <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah, your, your oldest is starting to look more and more like you every minute. Dude, it's insane. Yeah. It's, it's, so, it's, it's, she acts like me, that's it. Like Another question, does this layering work on thicker hair? Absolutely, this, hair, this will actually work on textured hair as well. Maybe not extremely textured, but absolutely with uh, with any kind of wavy, thick hair, because what has happened is it's been cut on a concave. So the, the whole idea of a concave is it is it collapses hair. It did because of the roundness of the head and because of the way that it was cut on a bias, will create some volume in the crown, but it won't create a gap or totally. it won't create any kind of a ledge. So yes, this can absolutely be cut on thick hair. It's actually perfect for thick hair. It's perfect for wavy hair. Really, it's just, it, it, the only time it's not good on hair is if it is 
extremely highly textured hair. If it's highly textured, because of the distance and the proportions between the top and bottom, it may be just a little bit too aggressive and you may end up with some separations of layerings. Uh, I tend to stay, steer a little more towards like convex versus concave when you start dealing with highly textured hair. Totally, so, I, it's all, I mean again, and also, Someone with really curly hair, this might not work as well for because with really curly hair, you're all, well, and that is by default also highly textured hair. It doesn't matter if it's on conca Caucasian or African American, whatever it is, um, because the the more collapsed an internal shape is, and the more weight you remove in uh, in relation from the nape to the outline, the more the shape is going to separate internally, right? Uh, which is why a lot of times. <clears throat> Long square layers tend to work best for really curly hair because of the nature of curl, right? So what I'm also gonna do because I wanna show off, and this is something that I, if, I end up, or if I ever dry cut someone's hair, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll give them the option uh, of having it, you know, they can leave with it straight or they can leave with it curled. And in this case, I wanna show both looks, right? Because they just sat there and looking in the mirror at what I'm doing with it straight. So now I'm going to show them what it can look like curl too. And um, curls with long hair, it's really important to remember that the whole point of it is to look disheveled and to look lived in, right? So the number one technique that I try to show people is first of all, to alternate right and left, right? To go back and forth. So my row below, I did right, the row above, I'm going to go outward towards the left. And I also tend to grab towards the roots twist it towards the roots, and then pull downward with gravity so that the hair strand itself is a lot looser, right? It's just like a perm technique. If you do a horizontal curl, like so, you're going to have a much tighter curl, right? Almost like a Shirley Temple kind of curl, right? Whereas if I take that same exact strand of hair and spin it diagonally downward, I'm going to loosen it up to where it falls much more naturally and softly, okay? And in going through and curling right to left and alternating as I work my way up the head, I'm also doing a bricklay pattern, which uh, if we all remember from hair school, bricklay perms tend to lay the most flatteringly because you're staggering the point that each curl naturally falls at, okay? Do people still roll perms in hair school? Mm -hmm. They do, okay. Mm -hmm. You know what's bizarre is that a lot of my students that have started with me in class over the last six months uh, did not take clients because they were virtual in hair school. So that's something that's really interesting. I think we all, because COVID kind of messed everything up for, well, everything. And we all have to remember that like, it's more important than ever to take accountability for your education and your craft. And if you, are learning from home, get mannequin hats, practice at home. If you're learning in a salon that has a training system like we do, then you know, utilize your time to your, to your advantage, right? Bring in models and work on mannequins. Like if all you ever do is watch a computer screen or watch a phone without executing anything technically with your hands, you're only going to get a small facet of education, okay? So hair is always most flattering when turned away from the face. So I'm still turning it away from the face, from the cheekbone down, but I'm also keeping a much looser curl and going diagonally downward with the floor. But then I'll come behind it and I'll do two curls towards the face because I want the hair to all move loosely. Oh, uh, we just got a shout out from a, a, one of my uh, Facebook friends, uh, Sid Satong. Sid is an awesome, awesome educator out of uh, London. He's a former Sassoon guy, has his own academy in London. He actually focuses on mostly on barbering. Uh, he is one of those that is another one that's just amazing to watch when you see his demonstrations, when you see his in-person classes. He does everything from color classes for men to uh, wet shaving. I mean, everything across the board. So I, if you're ever looking to be in London and take a uh, class uh, on especially on men's stuff definitely look him up he's an amazing amazing educator and a great guy we see him here on the hairbrained uh, group all the time I love seeing him here 
Um, I'm also seeing people, uh, once again, all across the pond, and a few people mentioning that they love doing perms. And ironically, I actually, I had a young man in my chair on Friday. He just had a perm. Wow. He has... Did he have a mullet too, or did he just have a perm? No, 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 no. He had long, shaggy hair. Uh, he actually had uh, went through a pretty extensive jaw surgery, okay. and so hadn't had his hair cut for about six months, had unbelievably thick, straight hair, and his sister told him that he should get a perm. He came in, oh my God, we cut his hair, and he ended up walking out looking like Jon Snow. I like uh, it. Yeah, I was, I was actually one of the best perms I've seen in a very long time. But yeah, I mean, so I don't, uh, I well, don't doubt that some texture is coming back well, in hair. Look, it's like anything, and I always tell my clients this because for a while, right, um, you know, we are teaching a ABC type curriculum, right? Like we're teaching the basics, layering, one length, graduation, squared, triangular, round. Those are the basics, right? And a lot of my students for the last couple of years haven't been particularly keen on really absorbing and retaining these basics because what's trendy? Long, loose, wavy hair that has texture, right? So something that I always have to remind them of because I'm not that old, but at 36, be quiet, I'm not that old. At 36, I have seen trends, right? When I went into New Talents in our protege program 15 years ago, girls with pin straight hair had comb overs from all the way over here and wanted me to iron their hair straighter, right? When I got into hair, it was because every, a uh, cute girl that I had a crush on that went out dancing to 80s dance nights had asymmetrical haircuts with rat tails. That was awesome. And you know, when I started working for Van Michael and I started paying my way to go and do hair shows with them, I was of course not on stage, but I was backstage, you know, pulling bobby pins out for Daniel and sleeping on the floor of the lobby and stuff like, <laughs> but you know, it was because we were doing cool asymmetrical hard geometric haircuts. And those are starting to come back, as well as weird things like mullets. I, I had a teenage girl the other day that w dressed like she was in the craft, but she basically wanted a Meg Ryan 90s shag. So it's important for people to not take anything off the table when you're learning and you're training, uh, because you never know what trends are going to come back around. I never in a million years thought that I would see Genco's come back and they're back. So if Genco's can come back, so it can perms. Yeah, it's amazing. You, you mentioned that right when COVID started, I was actually taking a, a class at Menspire in London. And what I had noticed when I was in London walking around, whether you're talking about in the heart of Covet Garden or out at, in Camden Town, is guys were wearing these really loose, um, straight cut jeans that were that reminded me of Jenko so much, except for that they were short. Oh yeah, the high rise. They were high rise Jenkos. I was like, this is so. It, so everything does come back around. So I do have to say that uh, uh, exactly what you're saying is so correct. Because they're not Jenkos for guys that listen to Corn and Lavisca. They're Jenkos for guys that listen to Travis Scott. Jenkos. Yeah. Jenkos. Yeah. Not Jen. Jenko. Jenko. Don't tell me. I wore them too. Jenkos. Jen, Jen, Jen I think. The, that trend is a play on the 40s prisoner outfit. Absolutely. Oh, okay. It is. Yeah, yeah. It is. Completely. Like, they're like uh, ankle. It's like gauchos, yeah. Yeah. almost. No, it, it definitely has, that's where it comes from. Don't knock karate pants until you try them. Well, Listen, I got one kid who wears <laughs> Taekwondo karate pants, you know, seven days a week. All right, All right so it looks like we are finishing up here. Um, this is beautiful. I mean, very, very salon friendly, a lot more interesting way of creating those layers, especially when you start dealing with hair that's extremely dense, but each strand being extremely fine and being chemically treated. Somebody had asked if you needed to treat chemically treated hair before starting this. It's not a bad idea to use like a leave-in conditioner, um, some sort of something smooth when blow drying the hair before you start. Well, and someone right, who has buddy. hair that doesn't want to lighten up easily, using Olaplex or something like, um, you know, Aveda's um, Daily Hair Repair, uh, the botanical, uh, you know, stuff. I mean, I think it's really important to, like, always treat the hair to feel good because you don't want someone with really fine hair that's blown out from bleach and you're going through and scraping through it with scissors. So, but, you know, the important thing here is that it looked great when it was straight. It looks great when it's curly. Um, she still has all of her length, really. And, but she actually has like 
some of these shorter pieces here, which bounce up at the shoulders when diffused out a little bit more. And, you know, I just think that it's important for people to focus on things that are salon friendly. Cause like I said, like shags and mullets and shaving, I mean, that stuff's awesome and it's important to know, but remember too, that you have to do things that clients want in the salon. And a lot of my clients with long hair don't want to chop it all off and they really want to feel like I'm listening to them with them retaining their hair as much as possible. So I think that's what we did today. So practice with all of these types of techniques on mannequins first because you don't want to learn how to slice through hair in a razor technique on a live model, right? Or you can, just remember that it's important that they know that you're learning and uh, have fun with it. Cool, mm -hmm. so thank you everybody.